um, the problem we have right now is the virus is out of control in this country, out of control. Um, and so testing, tracing, and quarantine works less well when you're out of control. The only thing that works when you're out of control is masks, social distancing, and lockdowns. Our problem is we did not have consistent lockdowns, uh, and so the virus is out of control. So the countries that did well, as the virus was was out of control, and there were a lot of infections, upward swing of the virus, instituted lockdowns. We didn't have masks, even without masks, se severe lockdowns. And in the case of Germany, in six weeks, they'd controlled the virus enough. They put in place during those six weeks the, the effective testing, tracing, and quarantine that was necessary. So every all of the countries that controlled, they have sporadic outbreaks. We're always going to have sporadic outbreaks until we have a vaccine and effective therapy and or infective therapy, the two work well together. In fact, vaccines generally work better when you're under control rather than when you're out of control. Uh, um, but they put those systems in place so that they can manage the outbreaks when they happen. They have the testing available rapidly, they have the tracing, and so they identify outbreaks of 100 people or 50 people. They do wide-scale testing, then they trace everyone and quarantine. And so you can do confined lockdowns or small approaches, and then you can actually predict. So schools in Europe have been reopening since, for months, for months, quite safely, um, um, because they did the things that needed to be done up front. They had intensive nationwide lockdowns, consistent lockdowns, put in place test, trace, and quarantine, and so we're able to do it. Countries in Asia that already had those systems that never truly got out of control, never closed all their schools, never had to do full lockdown, which is a good message for us looking forward. We need to build that infrastructure so that for the next pandemic, we're, we'll look more like them than Europe or we did. Europe will put those systems in place for the most part. I hope we actually have the fortitude to do it as well. Um, but we're in a really bad spot right now because we let it get out of control. No one in the world has a graph that looks like ours, with the exception of Brazil, um, you know, India, Russia, Mexico. Um, Mexico's even looks better than ours. Uh, we never had a true lasting downward trend. You know, this is a global pandemic. It is not a United States pandemic. And um, as the virus moves around the world, it can mutate, which is called genetic drift. The virus is always mutating. And again, if, if there, the more mutations there are naturally occurring, the more likelihood there is that a mutation will, will be created that will be resistant to whatever we try to throw at it, whether it's a vaccine or therapy. And so it is in our interest to have the lowest possible transmission around the world because if there's virus spreading all over the world, we're at risk for it. And we know that because the virus came from someplace else. Our influenza epidemic every year comes from Asia too. It's not because it's Asia, it's because of the natural course, time course of the viruses and where they come from and emerge and, and move. So lots of viruses come from, from Asia. Viruses come from Africa. Some viruses actually originate in the United States too and then get spread around the world. So, that's the nature of a global world and, and spread. And, and that's why we have pandemics in this way. I mean, so the 1918 pandemic um, basically followed troop movement. Um, and there were about um, uh, 75 million people total involved in military action in World War I, uh, 75 million total. And not all of them moved around. It, was, it actually followed those who moved around. Last year alone, in the, or in 2018 in the United States, 324 million people did international travel in and out of the United States, which is great for our economy, but that's what's happening in the world. And um, so the risk of virus moving globally because of population uh, and movement, because population is growing, because we're getting closer to animals and because of climate change, the change in climate, which for those of us on Kent County have experienced you know, pretty massively the last two weeks, the impacts of all of us, um, those factors will make new pandemics more likely. 
The reason we need vaccines around the world is to see if they work all over the world, but most importantly, so that we contain and control viral spread as much as possible because anywhere we are not safe unless everyone is safe. As long as virus is moving and lurking anywhere in the world, we are at risk. So international engagement is enlightened self-interest. We are the unquestioned leader in global health or have been. Some of that isn't quite where it was in the, in the recent past. Uh, but the, but the, US, the rest of the world still looks to the United States for that moral leadership, uh, that humanitarian leadership, that scientific and intellectual leadership. Um, and so it has that component. That's who we are as a people. You know, that, that is, whether it was the Marshall Plan or, you know, what, we, what President Bush launched and has become bipartisan on international aids that saved 17 million lives. Um, uh, that is part of who we are. But it's also just in, even if we didn't have that piece, it is in our self-interest to ensure there's as little virus as possible circulating in the world. Inequality drives pandemics. So the HIV pandemic has been driven from the beginning by inequality, the tuberculosis pandemic. Um, so in the case of HIV, at least in the United States, it was actually around um, uh, homosexual men, gay men in the beginning. But in Africa, it is driven largely by gender-based um, discrimination um, and violence. Uh, also stigma, people who are positive have a stigma attached to them. Um, that's been less of a case around COVID, but still real. Um, but certainly for smallpox, polio, other diseases, um, uh, that type of discrimination inequality exists. And in our own country, you can see it clearly. Um, African Americans, Latinos are at much higher risk of infection. In some cases, 10, 35% higher risk of infection and they're higher risk of death. The reasons for that are, pro are probably twofold as best we can tell. Uh, one is um, black people in this country, Latino people in this country, minorities in this country have more comorbid conditions more obesity, more diabetes, more hypertension. It's not because of, of genetics, it's because they're generally of lower income. And people of lower income have less ability to go to natural food stores and you know, find nice fresh stuff and cook it all the time. Um, and their income is very low, they don't have that capacity. And, so they, and they don't have access to healthcare. And if you don't have access to healthcare, you have hypertension and you don't know about it, so it gets out of control. Or uh, you have diabetes and you don't know about it until your foot needs to be amputated. I used to see this as a doctor on the south side of Chicago quite regularly, or in southeast Washington when, um, DC, when the DC public hospital was still there. Um, and so it's a mix of, um, uh, of those factors. And then the third factor, is while we can work from home and do a Zoom call like this, if you're in black or Latino in this country or Native American for that matter, uh, your job is much more dependent on being able, needing to go to work in service industry. So um, there are the people packing the goods and, and, and restocking the grocery stores and driving people around and um, uh, on the front line of, of health, of, uh, McDonald's or wherever. And so they're more exposed. And then they also have these other risks. And this is something I think a lot of people I know don't really have not connected to the incredible inequality in this country and the huge disparity of who's most at risk and why. Um, and, um, and that fuels the pandemic because it's moving rapidly in those populations who don't have access to healthcare and are getting more exposed. Okay. Um, but we don't see that. We also don't see, you know, one of the most striking statistics to me is that 40% of people, 40% of people making $40,000 or less lost their jobs. And about 7 million people have lost their health insurance so far because of the economic issues related to um, this disease. And then the last thing I would mention is, you know, how did 
we're so focused appropriately on reopening schools because if you don't reopen schools, you can't reopen your economy. And the other thing is that people are afraid of going out in a restaurant or a shopping mall or going back to work or sending their kids to school because there's so much infection in the community. You can declare whatever government policy you want about opening. The polls in the US are crystal clear. Most teachers and parents won't go back to school. Most people, when you reopen things, won't go out. So you cannot reopen an economy. You can order, you can do whatever you want, but you cannot reopen a school, you cannot reopen an economy if there's high community transmission and fear in the, in the environment. And that's why it was so important in Europe and Asia that before they started reopening schools and the economy, they got the virus under control because then the transmission was much lower when they reopened and they could identify it and quickly control it. And people had confidence that they could actually go back out into their normal activities because there was so little transmission and still is so little transmission. So these things go together. We pitted health versus the economy. Any economist who's worth their salt will tell you that's insane because if people aren't confident, confidence drives economies. If people aren't confident about going back into life, you, you can open whatever you want. You're not gonna reopen your economy. Um, we're in deep trouble, I mean, if we lose our optimism. And, and this is another thing, you know, people, have, one of the privileges of, of the work I've had is traveling to 110 countries and meeting a lot of people in various roles and, Truly, people around the world look to America for many things, but one of them is optimism. You know, we're viewed as an optimistic people that are problem solvers and are focused on getting things done, but in a collaborative way, in a united way, in the United States. And people actually value that optimism and value that hopefulness. And, they, and there's good historical reason for it, you know whether it was World War I or World War II or post-World War I when we fed Europe, or post-World War II when we, when we saved the economies of Europe and, and Japan, or more recently when, we, when President Bush started but then became very bipartisan um, in Congress and, and with President Obama to be the leaders in global health and HIV, TB, and malaria. I mean, the American people have supported Africans to save 17 million lives from HIV, 17 million. So people, you have to be pretty optimistic to be able to do those things. And so our optimism is one of our greatest values and it's one of the values people respect and look to the most. And so we have to be optimistic. And to be honest, in this one, it's easy to be optimistic because we know it can be done. This is not difficult. This is not HIV, which is highly complicated. This is not complicated. And we know that because so many countries have done it. We really are, we're usually the outlier in a positive way. We are outlier in a negative way right now. So many countries have succeeded. Um, so we know it can be done. And we know it more than any because it was our expertise that supported those countries to be able to control their virus. So, Yes, we should be very optimistic if we do this right. Um, and then, importantly, that we use that knowledge with the rest of the world to create not only a national but a global system to detect, respond, uh, prepare, detect, and respond to any future pandemic so that this never happens again.